morning. Y'all just waiting on me. That was so nice. Let's stand as we begin our worship. Come on, you know it. Here we go.
I'm awesome. We're glad that you are here to worship with us today at the Vine. Uh, very excited about what God is doing through this series that we're doing right now, uh, and even some things that we're going to be doing in the service today. Just really excited about what God is doing. Hopefully, you got a bulletin as you went to your seat, uh, and in that bulletin is a connection card. We would love to have you take that connection card and fill it out uh, with some general information about yourself and whoever might be with you here today. Also, inside of the bulletin, there's some things I just want to bring to your attention. One, uh, next Sunday night, uh, we are doing our We Are the Vine gathering, which we've been doing um, August and September. Uh, this is September, right? Yeah. And we're going to do it in October. Uh, but uh, I want to encourage you guys, if you haven't done it yet, it's at 5 o'clock next Sunday night uh, to sign up on the back sheet uh, back there. And um, it's going to be the last one we do this year that has child care available. So if you need child care, uh, I want to encourage you to sign up for that. We'll be doing a couple others, but we won't have child care for those. So again, back table is a place to sign up for those if you have not done that yet. And then coming up, uh, as you all know, the, the fair is getting ready to invade our town. Um, and one of the blessings that we get to do, one of the ways that we reach out to all the people who are out there, is by hosting the baby changing station out there. We've done this now for over 10 years, and our denomination puts it on and sets the tent up and all that. I'll just go ahead and tell you, you do not have to change the babies. <laughs> Number one question answered, right? You do not have to change the babies. It literally is a hospitality area where they have some changing tables. A parent can come in, change their kid, drop their dirty diaper off, and then we can wipe up, um, desanitize uh, the areas to have a place for mothers who are breastfeeding, that they can go in there and do that. And so our church has Saturday, October 9th. And so in the bulletin are the shifts that are there, how many people we need for those shifts. If you're interested in any of those, please just let me know. Hey, I can do this shift on, this, on, um, on that day. And uh, just get that information to you. You get a free ticket to get in, so you don't even have to pay to get in uh, to go do this. So I want to encourage you to take part in that. And then, of course, fall retreat is coming up for all of you that are in our youth department. Um, that is open, and so uh, you can make your deposit and sign up for that um, through the site that's in the bulletin right there. Okay? All right, well, let's take a minute and stand up and say hey to one another this morning.
you have your Bibles, you can turn to Psalms 73. Fairly unconventional this morning. But I'm unconventional. Psalm 73. Maybe you can identify. Truly God is good to Israel. To those who are pure in heart. But as for me, my feet had almost stumbled. My step had nearly slipped. For I was envious of the arrogant when I saw the prosperity of the wicked. For they have no death. Their bodies are fat, slick, and healthy. They are not in trouble as others are. They are not stricken like the rest of man. Does everybody feel that way sometimes? Like all the good stuff is going to the wrong guy? Let's skip down to verse 16. But when I thought how to understand this, it seemed to me a wearisome task until I went into the sanctuary of God then I discerned their end we get lost sometimes in the short term when we see how everyone around us seems to be getting rewarded and in our own minds we think that person doesn't deserve that but the simple fact of the matter is none of us deserve anything because we don't get grace through works. We got it free on the cross. And so this morning, I just somehow identified with that because this week, it's been a pretty tough week. Uh, I could use some expletives, but I'm not going to because I'm in church. Uh, so it's been, it's been tough. 
And I look around me, and I think, I got a lot to do. And it looks like everybody else seems to be hanging out and just enjoying life. But, you know, I got grace. And that's the best thing I could have because I don't deserve it. And so I take day by day, day by day, right? Lion and the lamb, that's who he is. He's victorious in my life and in your life. And he can take that bitterness that you might be holding on to and he can wash it away. So in this next song, we'll celebrate how he is the victor. But he's the victor through being the lamb who was sacrificed on the cross for our sake. And in that we rejoice and in repentance to him and giving thanks for what he's done, we can have new life every day. Amen.
lion and the lamb. And no matter what we're going through, whether we're just bitter and we need to repent, Lord, and just come under your grace like I did this week. Understanding that I, I know I'm not perfect, but I feel like I should be better than I was. Thank you. Thank you for accepting, accepting me for flaws and all. And I know there's someone else in here today who, who thinks the same thing. So Lord, as we continue in our worship, as the word is given, I ask that you would give strength to Rick, that he would be your mouthpiece this morning, and that our ears would be attentive to hear what you have to say to us this morning. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Awesome, awesome. Again, we're glad that you're here to worship with us this morning. Uh, so appreciate you guys. Tucker, I appreciate your transparency this morning and just sharing your heart. Um, Josh, if it wasn't for his grace, what would we all end up being? It would be a mess, even more of a mess um, than it is today. I just want to ask this question before I get into the sermon, just for my own. I'm trying to figure some things out here on the church's behalf, but how many of you right now sitting in here are going to be using the Uversion app? Okay, so quite a few of you. Good. I know a lot of people who watch it online uh, obviously use it so they can see the verses and the notes and stuff. I was just trying to figure out, you know, what kind of participation we're getting inside the worship center for those that are here. Uh, we have been doing this series, uh, going through the book of James. Um, this is week three, I believe, of it. And... Um, a couple weeks ago, we looked at James chapter 1, and uh, just I want to give you a quick review of where we've been, and sort of then we'll talk about where we're headed, uh, and we found out that our faith uh, is this growing part of our life. It isn't an instantaneous where we have complete faith. Uh, you remember I told you faith is trust, right? And so when we accept Christ, we begin this journey of faith, and our faith grows day after day after day after day. Unfortunately... It grows best in the hard times. It grows best in the words that, that James chapter 1 uses uh, in the troubled times. It grows best uh, in the testings and the trials. It grows best in temptations. It grows best in all the things of life that we don't want to go through. Right? None of us wake up on Monday morning you know, looking forward to a job loss or a doctor's call or anything like that. But the truth of the matter, and the truth of what James tells us, is that our faith grows best in those hard times. And we also learn in James chapter 1 that we don't just need to hear God's word, but we need to obey it. It isn't much good to us if we just hear God's word, but we don't obey it. We don't put it into practice. It's one thing to hear Psalm 73 that Tucker just read. It's another thing to go out of here just as bitter as you was when you walked in. Right? It's one thing to hear it. It's another thing to obey it. And that's what James chapter 1 told us. Last week, uh, we started on James chapter 2, and it was a warning against prejudice. And there's two kinds of prejudice that we talked about last week. There is prejudice towards someone. So, so we, have, we show them favor. We show them uh, partiality. We do for them because of some characteristic or demographic or classification or or whatever, and then there's prejudice against someone where we withhold, won't do, won't help someone again based on a characteristic, a classification, a demographic. And the example that James used was the rich and the poor. If, if a, he said if a rich person walked into your meeting, hey, we're in a meeting, if a rich person walked in here, would we treat them differently than if a poor person 
walked in here? Would we run to one and shun the other? Would we give one the best seat and tell the other one, you just sit over by the door? How would we treat those people? And the scripture tells us that we're to treat everyone the same. All of us are to treat everyone the same. And we learned at la the last part of last week's message is that prejudice is a heart issue. It's why the government can't legislate it out of our lives because it's a heart issue until you and I deal with our hearts, change our hearts if we need to towards this, and things don't change. And the truth of the matter is only God can change our hearts. And so that's where we've gotten so far. Today we're going to pick up in the last part of James chapter 2. And so we're going to be looking at verses 14 to 26. So I just want to start by reading uh, in verse 14, and then we will uh, take off and go from there. What good is it, dear brothers and sisters, if you say you have faith, but don't show it by your actions? Can that kind of faith save anyone? Suppose you see a brother or sister who has no food or clothing, and you say, goodbye, have a good day, stay warm, eat well, but then you don't give them any food or clothing. What good does that do? And so we're sitting here talking today, and if we read those first few verses of James chapter 2, if you've been in church for any length of time, really, if you've been a believer for a length of time, if you've read God's Word for a length of time, those few verses sort of raise a tension in our lives. They raise a tension in our lives, and that tension is this. I've always heard, I believe, I preach, we teach here at this church that salvation is by grace through faith in Christ alone. Okay? Maybe you've never put it in those words or, or whatever, but, but as I read the New Testament, as I read the Gospels where Jesus was talking about salvation, as I read the things that Paul wrote uh, in, in several of his books, and I'm going to read a few verses here in a second, uh, the, the, the reality is that salvation is by grace. Just like Tucker just said a minute ago, it is by grace, through faith, in Christ, and in Christ alone. So these first few verses, James begins to talk about these works and, and how what we do in our lives. Listen to what Paul said in Ephesians chapter 2. Ephesians chapter 2, uh, 8 and 9, he says, God saved you by his grace when you believed. And you can't take credit for this. It is a gift of God. Salvation is not a reward for the good things we have done, so none of us can boast about it. In Romans, Paul writes, can we boast then that we have done anything to be accepted by God? No, because our acquittal is not based on obeying the law. It is based on faith. So we are made right with God through faith and not obeying the law Galatians chapter 3 Paul writes again for you are all children of God through faith in Christ Jesus so is James and Paul saying something different it is James saying that your work saves you and Paul saying it's by grace the short answer is no they are not saying a different thing we, we have faith in a lot of things you may not believe that but we have faith in a lot of things. Some people have faith in the company that they work for, right? Your, your, your faith is uh, you're going to go to work tomorrow. They're going to have work for you to do. You're going to work all week. And at the end of the week, they're going to give you a paycheck or the end of the month or whatever. They're going to give you a paycheck. You have faith in that company. Some of us have faith in other people, right? Some of you in here, you're young enough, you're, you're, you're youth. And, and so you still have, you have faith in your parents that, hey, they're going to provide shelter and clothing and food and probably some other things that you want. You have faith in them. Some of us in here, we have faith in our spouses, right? We trust them. We, we put our faith in them. Some people have faith in money. It literally is just what is in my bank account? What's in my retirement account? What money do I have? And that's where their faith is. Some of you today, you came in here and had complete faith in the coffee. None of you saw it made. None of you asked to see the package that it came out of to look at the ingredients. None of you took time to 
uh, open up the pot and just see what was in there. You literally came in, stuck your cup under it, and you're just drinking and enjoying it. You have faith in the donuts. You don't know where they came from. You didn't see somebody make them. You didn't see the ingredients go in there. But you didn't come in and give them a, you know, you didn't let one of your kids lick it and just make sure they were okay, right? I mean, you just came in, got one, you just started uh, eating away. That's faith. You trusted that it was okay. You trusted that it wasn't going to hurt you. You trusted. See, a lot of us have faith. None of you came in today and turned the chair that you're sitting in upside down just to make sure that all the rivets were still in there, that all the nuts and bolts were connected, and that everything was sturdy so that you weren't going to fall to the ground. You put trust in that chair. See, there's an earthly faith. There's earthly faith. Now, now don't don't race to where you think you're going. There's an earthly faith, and that earthly faith is temporary. That earthly faith is temporary. That earthly faith it gives short-lived satisfaction, right? I mean, you, you drank that coffee, and it was delicious, and you ate that donut, and it was good. But you know what? That's just some short-lived satisfaction. It's going to work its way through your body. It'll be out of there in no time. And, and that earthly faith always ends up disappointing because the people that the people the places the things the items the ideas that we put that earthly faith in will sometime at some point let us down unmet expectations and so we have this earthly faith but see there's an eternal faith and it's completely different there's an eternal faith that quite honestly defines your eternity the bible makes it clear there are only two choices in eternity there's not five and you don't get to pick there's two choices there's a heaven and there's a hell and the eternal faith defines which of those two places that you will spend eternity God gives you the opportunity to accept him and to put your faith and your trust in his grace for salvation that could define your eternity for heaven but you also have the choice today to reject that to say, I don't want that. To say, I'm not ready for that. I'll wait on that. Whatever answer you may give, and yet that may define your eternity as well in hell. Uh, the eternal faith is life-changing. Eternal faith is what lets the alcoholic stop drinking the alcohol. It's what lets the addict stop taking the drugs. The, the eternal faith in Jesus Christ, it, it, it's life-changing for us. It heals our wounds. It takes away our bitterness. It, it takes away our anger when we're mad about something. This eternal faith that we have in Christ is, is life-changing. It's also uplifting, right? And all the troubles of this world that we have today, many that we see and so many more that we don't even see, it is Jesus who said, in this life you will have trouble. But then he said, take comfort because I have overcome the world. You see, this eternal faith, it, it, it helps us, it uplifts us, it encourages us. This eternal faith is a soul-satisfying faith, right? It, it just satisfies the inside of us. It satisfies many of those things that we war against in the flesh. It satisfies those. That's an eternal faith and a saving faith, if you will. So, so we have faith in a lot of things. That was point number one, if you're taking notes. We have faith in a lot of things. Now, verse 17 continues on. It says, so you see, faith by itself isn't enough unless it produces good deeds. It is dead and useless. Now, someone may argue, someone may argue, uh, some people may have faith, others have good deeds. But I say how can you show me your faith if it doesn't have good deeds? I will show you my faith by my good deeds. You say you have faith, for you believe that there is one God. Well, good for you. Even the demons believe this, and they tremble in terror. How foolish. Can't you see that faith without good deeds is dead and useless? He says here, point number two is, the works of your life are the proof of the faith inside of you. The works of your life are not the condition of your faith. 
It is the proof of your faith, of that inside of you. Imagine if your life was all marked by selfish, self-centered, self-ambitious desires in life. Everything you did was to further your own plan and your own agenda. Everything that you woke up uh, tomorrow and tried to accomplish tomorrow was for no bigger, greater purpose than just to appease yourself. How could that point to a faith based in Christ? I mean, let's think about this for a minute. Christ lived his entire life for a bigger purpose. From his birth to his resurrection to his ascension back to heaven, everything he did was for a bigger purpose. He performed miracles. He healed the blind. He, he gave deaf people uh, ears to hear. He, he, he uh, healed people. He raised people from the dead. I mean, it, it's, it's, it's great to heal somebody, but to bring somebody back from the dead, he did it all for a greater purpose. He taught people, right? You remember, the, you read the story about him being 12 years old in the temple. I mean, some of you in here are 12 years old. Uh, I don't know if you want to, to go and stand and teach in front of a bunch of master's degree educated people. And the Bible says that they were in awe of him. He was always, his life was always for a bigger purpose. He was trying to continuously point them to the Messiah. They had been prophesied about, they had been watching for, they had been looking for, and Jesus was always trying to say, I am him. He was innocent, and yet he was crucified. I mean, isn't that the ultimate selfless act? To be innocent and yet to be crucified, why did he do that? He did that to fulfill the scriptures that said, without the shedding of blood, there's no forgiveness of sins. He died on the cross for our sins. He shed the blood for the forgiveness for our sins. His life and everything he did was always for a bigger purpose. He rose from the dead, and today he is living in us. His death burial and resurrection, the, the works of his life, the things that he did, was his proof of his trust in his Father. And verse 19 is just for those people who want to just, you know, feel like they got to argue about something and they want to say this. You say you have faith for you believe that there is one God. There's a lot of people that will answer that question that way. You believe in God? Oh yeah, man, I believe in God. I believe in God. And he says, even the demons believe this and they tremble in terror and so James here just sort of gives you that mic drop moment for for those who maybe you're here today and you just want to say yeah I believe in God but you don't want your life to reflect that you you believe in God or you say you believe in God your faith is in God but you don't want to pattern your life after the life of Christ you don't want to pattern uh, his desires into your desires you, you try to compartmentalize. You try to keep those things separate. Verse 21 picks up. It says, don't you remember that our ancestor Abraham was shown to be right with God by his actions when he offered his son Isaac on the altar? You see, his faith and his actions worked together. His actions made his faith complete. And so it happened, just as the scripture says, that Abraham believed God and God counted to him as righteousness, uh, as righteous because of his faith. He was even called a friend of God. So you see, we are shown to be right with God by what we do and not by the faith alone. Rahab, the prostitute, is another example. She was shown to be right with God by her actions. When she hid those messengers and sent them safely away by a different road. He gives us here two examples, and I think it's really unique and pretty incredible the two examples he gives us. One is Abraham, who quite honestly is a hero of the faith. Right? You know, if there's a hall of fame, I mean, he's in it, right? Abraham is in it. And he's in it because his obedience showed <coughs> his faith and trust in God. Now, certainly, we could all agree in this room that what was asked of Abraham was probably one of the biggest uh, requests that you've ever seen God make of somebody. 
I want you to take your only son and get up in the morning and take him and some supplies and you go off. And you're going to come to a place, and when you get to that place, I want you to build an altar, and I want you to take your son and bind him up and put him on that altar, and I want you to sacrifice him in obedience to me. That's a big ask. You know how I know it's a big ask? Because if I asked Joe to do it, he'd probably punch me. If I, you know, if I asked Tucker to do it, he'd say, you're crazy. If I asked Bud to do it, he say, man, you're, you're, you're out of your mind. Bud's an elder. He'd have me, we'd be voting me out if I was walking around asking you guys to sacrifice your sons because I ask you to out of obedience to me. And yet Abraham obeyed what God called him to do. Crazy ask, but he obeyed, and God provided the land. And then he uses the example of Rahab, who quite honestly, by society's standard, by society's look at that point, was one of the lowest on the, the, the cultural pole. Maybe somebody with leprosy would have been seen as lower. Somebody with impurities would have been seen as lower. But quite honestly, in that day, to be a prostitute was about as low as you could go in the cultural scheme of things. And somebody said, well, why would God use a prostitute to accomplish that back then? Why would he use that? And I'll be honest with you, I think he did it to give us all hope. That if God could use someone like that, to, and, he, and that person would obey him, then certainly he can ask us to do things and we would obey him as well. So why would we think that our faith and our trust and our obedience is separate from the actions of our life? Why would we think today that our faith and our trust and obedience as God is different, separate, compartmentalized from the things that we do in our life. And I'll tell you why. It's called convenience. Convenience. Because if we understand and we believe that our faith and our trust and our obedience as God, in God is not separate from our life, is part of our life, then quite honestly it's going to cause many of us to look at our lives. It's going to cause calls us to ex access our, pro assess our priorities. Some of the things that are important to us maybe shouldn't be as important to us. Some things that aren't important to us maybe should be more important to us. It's going to, it's going to cause us to check uh, the things that we put our energy and our time and our, our effort into. If we realize that the works of our life and the faith in God that we say we have are something combined. They work together. They complete each other. Then it's going to cause us to take a hard look at our lives. This, uh, this paragraph is in the bulletin, and it uh, should be on you version stuff. I just want to read it. I, I sort of wrote It's not a paragraph. It's just one really, really long sentence. Any English teachers in the room? Yeah, you, you won't like this. Just from the grammatical part. You, you might agree with all of you. Go, but he didn't write it right, and you're right. I didn't. But here's what I put. A life planted with the seed of the gospel and watered with the blood of Christ, with the breath of faith and the presence of the Holy Spirit, cannot help but produce a life of good work. A life planted with the seed of the gospel. The, the, the gospel is the seed. The works are not your seed. The works are the fruit from the seed. But the gospel is planted in your life. It's watered with the blood of Christ, the breath of faith, and the presence of the Holy Spirit. We cannot help but produce a life of good works. Your works are not a condition to your salvation, it is proof of your salvation. In other words, you can't just talk about it, you got to be about it. And to be quite honest with you, in the Gospels, Jesus gives us a huge warning about that. Because he says, there's going to be some of you that come to me that day and give me all sorts of reasons why I should let you into heaven. God, I was a member of the Vine Church in Perry, Georgia. 
for 10 years. God, I, I watched the nursery. I worked with the babies. God, I did this. God, I did that. God, I did this. God, I did that. And he's going to say, depart from me. I never knew you. Because none of those works are the basis for your salvation. It is by grace, through faith, in Christ alone. But all of those things are proof of your salvation. They provide proof of the faith and the hope and the trust that is inside of you. And then verse 26 closes out chapter 2. It says, It's just as the body is dead without breath, so also faith is dead without good works. Uh, point number three is we need to change our perspective from got to to get to. From got to to get to. There's a lot of Christians I know, and here's what they would say. I, I got to read my Bible today. I got to pray. I got to go to church. I got to tithe. I, I got to serve. I, I got to put others before myself. And we need to change that perspective from I got to to I get to. I get to read my Bible today in a very free country. I get to pray anytime, anywhere, for anything. I get to go to church and worship and fellowship with my brothers and sisters in Christ. I get to tithe a portion back of what God has given me. I get to serve others and let, Jesus, and let them see Jesus through me. I know that you all have heard this question many times, and I'm going to close with this. I know you've heard, if you were arrested for being a Christian, would there be any evidence to convict you? Now, I know you won't believe this, or maybe you will, but in our world today, that happens. I mean, there are countries where you get arrested for being a Christian, and they bring you into a court, and the, and the, the, the person who is literally prosecuting you about being a Christian in this court is going to provide all the evidence to the people, to the government, that you are a Christian. Now, we don't do that in our country yet, but it happens in our world today. But if someone were to bring you up on charges of being a Christian, would there be enough evidence in your life to convict? James is not saying something different than Paul. James is sort of taking what Paul said about our salvation by grace through faith in Christ alone and saying, if you have that, then this should be evident. This should be in your life. This should be part of your life. They're not separate. They make each other complete. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you today for James, and I thank you for this book, and Lord, just the way he speaks plainly to us. And Lord, uh, today as we're, we're here in this place, and Father, uh, I believe we're all here to worship you. I believe uh, we're all here to, to fellowship with one another, to love you. Father, it may very well be that, that some here today do not have that salvation through faith. They've never made that decision, taken that step of faith to put their trust and their, their eternity and their life in your hands. To take the gift of forgiveness that you've already completed on the cross into their life, just to repent of their sins and just to agree with you that those are, those are wrong and to ask forgiveness of those. So, Father, if there's someone in here today, I pray that, that you speak to their heart, that today they may make that eternal defining decision for eternal faith, that they would trade the earthly faith that they've been trusting in all sorts of other people and things and money and companies and all of those. Father, they would trade that in for an eternal faith through Christ. Father, for those that are in here today that have that faith in you, that have that relationship with you, who have received that salvation through Christ. Lord, may you encourage us today. Show us where our lives do not reflect that. Point us in a direction in our lives where, where it can show the fruit of the gospel in our lives. Father, we thank you for that. I 
Thank you that you are a personal God. And you're interested in every single person in this building today. And I thank you for that. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. We're going to stand and Tucker, then we're going to lead us in a song. It's called, Give Me Faith to Trust What You Say, That You're Good. And then it says some other stuff. And that may, may that song be sort of the beat of our heart as we sort of close out this service. Let's stay in.
Trust you say you're good and your love great. I'm broken inside, keep my life. Give you my glory. Oh, I am sure. We have an exciting opportunity this morning as a church family, and I see most of the kids have gotten dispersed, so that's good. Uh, one of the blessings of being in a military family is to have military people in your church, and uh, that is a huge, huge blessing. And today, as a church family, we get to share, we get to share uh, in the opportunity for one of our church members. Uh, in their re-enlistment re ceremony. So at this moment, I'm going to call Karen Zeust up. She's actually our preschool director as well. So she's coming up. And Johnny, I'm ready for you. That's why I'm calling your name, brother. <laughs> it ain't just because I like you. There you go. Oh. This, 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 I'm turning it over to you guys. All right. All right. We have a full ceremony here. Okay. Go for it. I'm going to just close in a word of prayer, and then we'll dismiss out of here. Can I, can I share with you something very special? I saw you sort of get jerked up, and this might jerk me up. But when Karen asked if she could do this here, here's what she said. This is our family here. 
they have tons of family in Oklahoma and out that way and, and all of that, but, but this is their family here. And so that's why she wanted to share this with us in front of her family today. So I, I just consider it a great honor uh, to do that and uh, appreciate you guys uh, being, including us in that. I want to pray for you guys and, and, for, and for all of us as we depart out of here. Lord, we thank you for this day. And Father, I thank you for Karen and her, her dedication to, to re-enlist, Lord, and continue to serve our country. Lord, I thank you for her and so many like her, Lord, that wear the uniform today and for so many who've worn the uniform in the past and have served our country to help protect freedom and to help to protect us from people who would try to cause us harm. And Father, I pray that as she begins these next six years, that, Father, uh, your hand would cover her, your hand would be about her, uh, that, Father, as she takes her steps, uh, as she follows her orders, that, Father, that, that your hand and your presence and your spirit uh, would be on and in her life. And Father, we thank you for people like Karen and others who are willing to risk so much to serve our country. And we thank you for that, Father. And we pray that today, as we leave out of this place, that we'll leave out as soldiers for Christ, enlisted for life, to go into this world that is dark and dying and be a light for you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Thank you guys for being here today. Y'all have a great, great week.